The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the fear you can hear. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. We are about to bring you a tale of magic. What a word, magic. What do we mean by magic? What are we thinking when we say something is magical? Why, only that we do not understand how it came to be, or even what it is that came to be. Or, for that matter, if it ever really did come to be. Our mystery drama, The Walls of Jericho, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Robert Dryden. Anything can have magic. A name, a poem, a face, a touch, a phrase of music, a sudden silent thought that brushes across the mind. But it won't be captured. No, not magic. For magic merely happens. Watch out. Ready or not, here it comes. It's cold in here, don't you think, Cudworth? Well, Drindle's gone to fetch another log. He'd best hurry. Well, the fire will have burned itself out completely. That's asking a bit much, isn't it? For Drindle to hurry? <laughs> I suppose one shouldn't ask too much. Ah, oh, poor old Drindle. How old is he now? What would be your guess, Ashley? I wouldn't hazard one. He's been steward at the club since before I became a member. Ah, here he comes. I don't like to see him carrying a log that size. <sighs> Oh, Drindle. Ah, oh, you wanted something, Mr. Ashley? A half an hour ago, Drindle, I asked for a brandy and soda. But you have your brandy, Mr. Ashley. Ah, but have I my soda? Haven't you? Oh, oh, you haven't. I, I, I'll get it for you right away, sir. Uh, right away. Um, possess your soul in patience, Ashley. Now, the club should really start to think of retiring him, wouldn't you say? Start to think... That's all we ever do. We never actually get on with the thinking, do we? Oh, oh hello. Oh, everybody. Hey, have you seen this? Uh, who's making that racket? Higgins just came in. Oh, him. Have, have you seen it? Have you? <sighs> seen what, Higgins? Well, I, I just took it off the bulletin board, Winthrop. Now you're president of the club. You should be the first. Uh, read it aloud. Oh. At four o'clock in the afternoon of January 12th, the devil will come down the chimney of the fireplace in the member's lounge. Let's see that. I just this minute took it off the bulletin board. Now, who's playing jokes around here? Now, who wrote this? Did anyone here put this notice up on the bulletin board? Now, let me see it, Winthrop. At four o'clock in the afternoon of January 12th, the devil will come down the chimney of the fireplace in the member's lounge. What the... <laughs> that, that, that fireplace right there. How very interesting. It's not interesting at all. Just a feeble attempt to be funny. But it wasn't on the bulletin board this morning. Well, it wasn't there an hour ago when I came in from dinner. Now, was it Cutworth? Well, I certainly didn't see it. Well, somebody put it there. The, the devil could have put it there. Oh, rubbish. Well, well, he might have. He's very ingenious. I've heard. Now, let's not let ourselves be carried away, Higgins. Uh, Mr. Ashley, sir. Uh, what is it? Your soda, sir. Well, set it down. Edwindle, have you seen this? What is it, sir? Mr. Higgins found it pinned to the bulletin board. Here, read it. At four o'clock in the afternoon, January 12th, the devil will shimmy the fireplace in the member's lounge. Ah, what does it mean? It means that the devil will come down that chimney at four o'clock on January 12th. That's what it means. Oh, surely not, Mr. Higgins. Definitely not. It's a joke, isn't it? Of course it is. But, uh, on the other hand, 
Uh, really, Cotworth, you and your other hands. Uh, let's mark it down as a joke until we know better. Well, at least until then. Anyway, until the afternoon of January 12th uh, at uh, four o'clock. <laughs> Which, uh, Come to the table. Boobies, every one of them. Now your oatmeal get cold. Oats, clods. Uh, Don't blame me if it's spoiled. I bamboozled them like the bunch of noodles they are. <laughs> Anytime you'd care to state what you're talking well, about, I'm all ears as the saying goes. Meantime, come sit down. The esteemed high and mighty members of the Ralph Waldo Emerson Gentlemen's Club from the president, the exalted Mr. Amos Winthrop, on down. Oh, them. Imbeciles. Now, you... You didn't go making trouble, did you? That remains to be seen. Because they're just waiting for an excuse to give you the sack. You're not so young anymore. I know that, Martha. Not always... Strictly teetotal on the job, I suspect. I'm never drunk. Well, a man needs to be a little elevated to spend ten hours a day with those back bay snobs, but I flim-flammed them. Now, look here, Timothy Drindle. Don't you go doing anything to raise the hackles on those gentlemen. Income poops. Because if they should give you the old heave-ho, you know where you'd wind up, don't you? Right here at home with me, and I won't have that. They're not about to fire me, not right away. As a matter of fact, it's I who may have lighted a small fire under them. And they should be starting to feel the heat of it soon now. Very soon. Timothy, what have you done? Oh, nothing very much. I only posted a notice on the bulletin board, that's mm -hmm. all. What kind of a notice? A modest little notice stating that on January 12th at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the devil would descend the chimney of the fireplace in the members' lounge. You said the devil? <laughs> you should have seen the excitement, especially Mr. Higgins. Oh, he's such an emotional little man. You invoked the name of the devil? No, I did no such thing. You summoned up the devil? Oh, I played a joke on those superior snobs who've been taking me for a joke all these years. That's all I did. Oh, once you summon up the devil, Timothy, it's it's not so easy to send him back where he came from. Will you stop it, Martha? I only want to make them worry. Those fine gentlemen who've never had a care in the world since the day they were born. Worry? How? About what? Worry. Will he come down the chimney? <laughs> oh, they'll worry from now to the 12th of January, and I'll be there ten hours a day to watch them worry. And if his satanic majesty does come down the chimney, what then? Oh, he won't. He won't. I wrote the notice myself, and old Beelzebub didn't dictate it either, if that's what you're thinking. No, I'm thinking... I'm thinking you've started something, Timothy, that he won't be able to stop. <laughs> Your coffee, Mr. Winthrop? Oh, thank you, Drindle. That's quite a fire you've got going there. <laughs> I always try to keep up a good, smart blaze, sir. Nothing special about this particular fire, Drindle? Mm, no, sir. It's January 12th, Drindle. And precisely three minutes before four in the afternoon. Is it indeed, sir? Oh, come off it, Drindle. Surely you're not indifferent to the heralded appearance of the Prince of Darkness down the chimney. Well, it's really no concern of mine, Mr. Winthrop. Well, the membership doesn't share your aplomb, Drindle. Lounges fill to overflowing. Oh, so it is, sir, and I'd best stir myself. Other gentlemen will be wanting coffee. Ah, uh, bring me a brandy, Drindle, if you have the time. All the time in the world, Mr. Higgins. Uh, old Drindle's the only cool character in the room. Mm. Even Ashley, who thinks this whole thing's nonsense, Ashley doesn't even believe the devil exists, for goodness sakes. <laughs> well, he, he's still been sitting on that little hassock by the fireplace since noon. I tried to get him to lunch with me, but he wouldn't budge. Oh, suspects a trick, no doubt. What do you? Well, it is possible, I suppose. But uh, who'd want to play a trick like that? I mean... Even if someone wanted to, how'd he go about it? 
Now, now suppose something, or uh, someone, descends that chimney at four o'clock, as I am firmly persuaded he will, who or what could do that? There's a great roaring fire going. Old Drindle saw to that. Well, suppose someone with a perverse sense of humor should toss a dummy down the chimney. We'd find it afterward. Well, not if it was reduced to ashes. Ah, but something would remain. It couldn't all burn up. Am I right? Well, ask Cudworth. He's the brainy one. Gentlemen, all prepared for the big moment? Ah, hello, Cudworth. Only the devil himself could survive a trip down that chimney. Am I right, Cudworth? I'd say so, yes. Ah, ah. Oh, oh, it's nearly time. Nervous? Well, I don't know what to think. I mean, I don't know what to expect. The whole thing is nerve-wracking. Positively devastating. It's time. <laughs> What's that? Oh, 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 oh. It's him! It's him! The devil himself! He's there! See him? There he is! There is certainly something there. Someone. Oh, it's the devil! It's old Harry! The devil! Is it really the fiend? Look at him! Standing in the flames! He's laughing! Is he really laughing? Oh, that old serpent! Look at him! He's gone. No, 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 he's not! He's still there! In the flames! No. Laughing in the flames! He's Oh, oh. Well, now he's gone. Well, that was quite an experience. Yes, it was. Oh, it was the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. Oh, really extraordinary. Well, now, are you all satisfied? What do you mean by that, Ashley? His satanic majesty failed to put in an appearance. Of course he put in an appearance. You, you didn't see him. Now don't tell me you did. Of course we did. He was all in black. Had to no, put... no, he was dressed in red. Uh, black and red, I thought. Well, he had red hair. You couldn't see his hair. He wore I a cap. I saw his hair. It was sort of waving in the flames, oh, a draft or something, but it never caught on fire. I, I distinctly remember he, noticing that. He wore a cap. You couldn't see his hair, and his mustache was black. No cap. A cap and a big black cape. He kept his cape around him all the time he was standing yes, there. Yes, but the cape was red, a very bright red. <laughs> now listen to yourselves. Listen, will you? You all saw him. You all say you did. But each of you saw something different. Huh? Red cape, black cape, black and red cape. Why, it's ludicrous. It is not ludicrous at all. We were all overexcited, all worked up over this thing, and maybe our our accuracy, our powers of observation were impaired. That's possible. Except I know he wore a big black cape. A big pardon, Mr. Higgins. Yeah, don't, don't bother me now, Drindle. Your brandy, sir. Uh, uh, Drindle, settle this argument for us, will you? What was the devil wearing? Yes. Devil, sir. What was he wearing when he came down the chimney? I wouldn't know, sir. I was not in the lounge. I was fetching Mr. Higgins' brandy. Did the devil make an appearance, sir? How, then, was the devil dressed? Oh, he was in his Sunday best. His coat was red and his breeches blue. And there was a hole where his tail came through. Those charming lines were written by Mr. Robert Southey at the turn of the century. But not our century. No. A hundred years before. Clearly, the devil had time to acquire a new suit of clothes. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Did the devil indeed descend the chimney of the Ralph Waldo Emerson Club in the afternoon of January 12th and stand laughing in the flames? There isn't complete agreement among the club members even now. More than a month later. Uh, Cudworth, I have to talk to you. Well, sit down, Winthrop. Uh, have you seen it? I've seen it. Yep. Wouldn't do any good to take it down from the bulletin board, I suppose. Well, half the membership's already seen it and told the other half. Lightning strikes again. I never dreamed it would, did you? Well, it's a slightly different bolt of lightning this time. Not the devil. 
The White Goddess, I believe the notice said. I copied it down. On February 8th, at 6 o'clock in the evening, the White Goddess will run naked through the members' lounge. Naked, eh? Uh, Cudworth, just who is the White Goddess? Daughter of Astarte, I believe. And, um, just who is Astarte? I'm sorry not to be up on these things, but it's not really in my area of concern. I believe Astarte is the goddess of fertility and, uh, sexual love. You don't say. Well, that would account for her being naked, wouldn't it? Uh... Cudworth, do we still believe in such things? Uh, goddesses of sexual love? And why shouldn't there be such a goddess? And why shouldn't she have a daughter? And why shouldn't the daughter be called the white goddess? You, uh, you don't believe she'll run naked across the members' lounge, do you? I didn't believe the devil would come down the chimney. But you did see him, didn't you? Yeah, or something that looked very like him. Assuming, of course, I know what the devil looks like. Cudworth, I saw his horns. Did you indeed? Have, have you seen it? Have, have you seen the notice? Yes, 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 we've seen it. Do you know that members are pouring in from all over the country? Oh, no. Members that haven't been inside the club in 20 years. We can't even begin to put them up. Half of them are stopping at hotels. Oh, heaven help us. Oh, cheer up, Winthrop. There's a chance the white goddess won't show. I don't know, Cudworth. I, I have a sinking feeling that she will. There isn't an empty hotel room in the whole of Boston. Why are you doing this, Timothy? What are you getting out of it? I'm getting something off my own back, that's what. I'll never understand you. Well, you haven't up to now, that's for sure. You're playing jokes on people at your age. It's no joke. Well, I don't know what else you could call it. It's a plot. A plot to make them squirm, those fine gentlemen with their fancy ways. Why should they go through their entire lives without knowing a moment's uncertainty or a pang of anxiety? They're always so damn sure of themselves. Ah. They're not sure any longer. They're divided amongst themselves already on the subject of the devil. I hear them jawing away about it in the lounge. Was he there or wasn't he? What did he look like? What did he wear? <laughs> Mr. Higgins says red. Mr. Winthrop says red and black. Mr. Cudworth says nothing at all, just looks wise. And Mr. Ashley says the devil never came down the chimney at all, so they're every last one of them crazy. I tell you, their chatter and their argument was driving me right up the wall. But I put a stop to it, all right. You... And just how did you manage to do that? By putting up the notice about the white goddess. That's how. Now they're all talking about her. And when is this white goddess making her debut? Six o'clock tonight. And is she coming down the chimney? No. Now, as the notice says, on February 8th at 6 o'clock in the evening, the white goddess will run naked through the member's lounge. Where will she come from? How should I know? I only wrote the notice. But I think it would be nice if she came in through the main door <sighs> and went out through a window. <laughs> yes, that would be rather nice. <laughs> and the room is filling up. It's amazing. Oh, I don't know. It isn't often, if ever, any of us gets to see the white goddess run naked across the lounge. You think they really believe? Well, who knows what they believe. Cudworth, do you believe? I'm here, as you see. Mm, I suppose that's the only possible answer. Well, it's the only one you're going to get. Do you believe, Winthrop? Like you, uh, I'm here. Uh, what? What's the time? 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 Cudworth, you always have the right time. Mr. Higgins, the clock on the mantle is exactly right. Oh, two minutes to six. Yeah. Uh, mind, mind if I sit down? Uh, we've been saving this chair for you, Higgins. Oh, that's nice of you. <laughs> well, the lounge is... 
Pretty well filled up, isn't it? Bursting at the seams. Oh, I've been studying all about the white goddess. Mm, daughter of Astarte, who in turn is the goddess of fertility and uh, sexual love. Oh, you knew that. Uh, Cudworth told me. Cudworth, you really do know everything. On the contrary, I know very little. Well, you've always seemed to me to know everything. And that's because you know less. Well, mind if I join you? Well, no, there, there, there's no place to sit, Ashley. Oh, what a pity. Well, you could sit on the floor. Now, how would I look sitting on the floor when the white goddess comes running across the lounge? No, no, I think I shall join old Drendel over by the window. Perhaps he'll fetch me a brandy. No, no, you, you haven't time. It's nearly six. Oh, you mean I might miss her goddesship? Oh, my, my, that would never do. Oh, geez. that ass doesn't believe she'll appear. Well, why did he bother to come here at all? Because if he doesn't believe, neither does he disbelieve. Just look at him. Laughing and joking with Drindle. Well, that's probably the first time he's ever spoken to Drindle, except to give him an order. You could say that about most of us, myself included. Well, Drindle's getting old. Poor old Drindle. Oh. Oh, it's, it, it's time. The, the, the time has come. Oh, would you look at her. Look at her. She's beautiful. Sublime. Oh, white goddess. Oh, heavenly thing. I never thought I should live to see anything so beautiful. The most exquisite thing I ever saw. Or ever shall see. Where did she go? She was here such a little time. She disappeared through the window. Uh, the wall, I think. No, 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 through the window. The one back of where Ashley's standing with Drindle. I saw Ashley turn and look out the window just as she vanished. You don't think it's possible he saw her too? Oh, no. Not Ashley. Well, Ashley? What? If you could stop staring at the stars, I'd like to ask you something. Magnificent. Yes, the stars are magnificent, but I have something else in my mind. Well, what's troubling you, Cutworth? Why, nothing very much, Ashley. Is something troubling you? Well, the way she disappeared. Simply melted into the astral light. Um... Who melted into the astral light, Ashley? Why, the white goddess. Well, don't tell me you didn't see her. Oh, yes. I saw her. Radiant in all her nakedness. Glowing like mother of pearl. Her long hair flying out behind her. Oh, but then you saw her. Yes. Now, the others, did they see her? Oh, yes. Of course. Oh, everyone must have seen her. Now, Drindle. Yes, sir. You saw her. No, Mr. Ashley. Oh, come now, Drendel. Of course you saw her. We were standing here together, side by side. I didn't see anything, Mr. Ashley. Now, don't tell me you didn't see anything, you old liar. Well, I, I was busy with something. You were not busy with something. We were standing here talking, and the clock struck six, and the door opened, and she came in. And she ran. Her feet hardly touched the floor. Ran across the lounge to this window, this one right here. Why, her shoulder brushed mine. I felt it. My left shoulder. Now, don't tell me you didn't see her or I'll break your back. Now, don't excite yourself, Ashley. The most beautiful spectacle it's ever been the good fortune of any of us to witness. And this numbskull Drindle stands there and tells me he didn't see it. He was busy with something. Oh, I won't stand for it. You listen to me, you fool. It's blasphemy. Unadulterated blasphemy for you to deny that you saw what I saw. What we all saw. Now, say it. Say you saw the white goddess run across this lounge, didn't you? Didn't you? No. You say it or I'll choke the light out of you. Ashley, this is going too far. He saw her. I know, he saw her. Now, Mr. Ashley, please, you're choking me. He I... saw it, he's going to admit it. Oh, Ashley! Oh, why couldn't you stay out of this, Cudworth? Oh, you might have killed him. Are you all right, Drindle? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm all right. Oh, Ashley, go into the bar and buy yourself a drink. You need it. Yes, I need it. I need it, all right. You're sure you're all right, Drindle? Yes, quite. Quite sure, Mr. Cudworth. Oh, by the way, Drindle, did you see the white goddess or didn't you? You don't need to be afraid to tell me. Either way. I didn't see anything, Mr. Cudworth. 
you see, I was busy with something and I... No, I didn't see anything at all. Well, I think I must be getting on home. Yes, it's been quite an evening, hasn't it? Quite an evening. A never-to-be-forgotten evening. Beautifully put, Ambrose. Well, come along. I'll, I'll drop you off. Uh, thank you. Uh, so long, everyone. Night all. Ho, ho. Wake up, Ashley. Yes, yes, I'll wait for you. Well, Cudworth, a never-to-be-forgotten evening. Well, at any rate, one I'll never forget. Hmm. I fancy none of us will ever forget. You leaving now? No. I'm going to stay until the room's cleared. It's about cleared now. Nobody much left. I, uh... I want to speak to old Brindle. He, he doesn't look too happy. Well, that was quite a going over Ashley gave him, wasn't it? Mm, looked that way. Ashley can be a rough man. Can't he, though? Well, <coughs> I'm off for home. Night, Winthrop. Night, Goodworth. A never-to-be-forgotten night. Oh, uh, Drindle. Uh, yes, Mr. Winthrop. May I speak to you for a minute? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Winthrop, of course. You all right? Perfectly all right. I couldn't help noticing you, uh, you and Mr. Ashley seem to be having an altercation of some sort. Uh, Mr. Ashley was angry, sir, because I wouldn't say I saw the white goddess. And why wouldn't you say you saw the white goddess? Because I didn't see her. But we all saw her, Drindle. Even Mr. Ashley saw her. She wasn't there. But my dear man, she was there. She ran across the lounge all naked, just as the notice said she would. Now, why do you persist in denying it? Because I wrote the notice. Oh, now, Drindle. And I wrote the other one, too. About the devil coming down the chimney. I wrote them both. And I made them up out of my head. Why are you lying to me, Drindle? I'm not lying, sir. But of course you're lying. I don't know why you're lying. Perhaps to make yourself important in our eyes. I am not lying. But we all saw her, Drindle. It was the most exquisite moment of our lives. We saw her. Therefore, you're lying. All minds are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a white goddess, We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Have you read your Shakespeare lately? If you have, you'll remember Hamlet's observation to his friend. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. If you haven't read your Shakespeare, now for the third act of The Walls of Jericho. Come eat your breakfast, Timothy. It's on the table. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd. They're trying to ruin me. Oh, he's off again. I never even turned around when I heard them whispering behind my back. Drindle's getting on. Poor Drindle. Drindle's had a drop too much. Mm -hmm, that part's true, all right. But when they called me a liar, and to my face... I don't have to take that. Who called you a liar? Mr. Amos Winthrop, the president of the club. The highest mucky muck of all the high mucky mucks, that's who. Well, what kind of a lie did you tell him? No lie. I told him no lie. I told him the God's own truth. That I had written those notices and put them up on the bulletin board. The one about the devil coming down the chimney and the one about the white goddess running naked across the lounge as well. Why wouldn't he believe you? Because he's a fool. 
The biggest fool and a pack of fools. I said, why wouldn't he believe you? He says he saw the devil, saw him come down the chimney and stand in the flames, and that most of the others saw him too. All but Mr. Ashley and a few other disbelievers. Oh, you should never have invoked the devil. I told you that at the time. But even Mr. Ashley is saying that he saw the white goddess run across the lounge. Radiant in her nakedness, she says, glowing like mother of pearl. <laughs> Imagine Mr. Ashley talking like that. He says she brushed up against him, against his shoulder, and then went out through the window and melted into the astral light. <laughs> Mr. Ashley, of all people. Maybe it happened. How could it have happened when I made it all up? Well... Come, eat your breakfast. No, no, I can't. I'm too upset. You're more upset than they are. Those fine gentlemen you were going to teach a lesson. Oh, don't you worry. I'll fix them. I'll put up another notice. Oh, now, Timothy, don't start up again. Only this time I'll make it so... so crazy, so outlandish. They'll see that it's only a joke. They won't be able to help themselves. Yeah, now, let's see. Uh, where's a pen? And a piece of paper. Uh, now, now, what shall I... Ah, I need to get them excited, all worked up, waiting for something, and then they let down when it doesn't happen. That's what I'm after. It... Yes, I've got it. On March the 2nd at 5 o'clock... You see, they'll all be having drinks in the lounge about that time. At 5 o'clock, a leopard will enter... Eh, uh, no... No, not a leopard. Uh, a tiger will enter the members' lounge. How's that? As long as you don't make it the devil. No, no, no. Better yet, three tigers will enter the members' lounge. No, no, no. I don't like enter. It's too sedate sounding, too tame. I will come through the windows. No. Will crash through the windows. Yes, that's good. Crash through the windows of the members' lounge. There. That should put Mr. Winthrop in his place. Somehow, Timothy, I don't think you were born to put Mr. Winthrop in his place. Ah, that's where you're wrong, Martha. It's precisely what I was born for, and this'll do it. Wait a minute. I thought of something else. What now? Listen to this. On March the 2nd, at 5 o'clock... Three tigers will crash through the windows of the members' lounge, one of them carrying a chicken in his mouth. Oh. Yeah. How's that, Martha? Huh? How's that? Oh, 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 oh that's perfect. <laughs> oh, uh, Drindle. Uh, Mr. Winthrop, yes, sir. Uh, stir up that fire, will you? Uh, yes, sir. That's, uh, that's fine. Uh, would you like another log, sir? No, no, that'll do it, I think. Weather's letting up a bit. Yes, it seems to be. You're in the club a bit early today, sir. Um, yes, a bit. Why, yes, it's only a little after four. Are you waiting for the tiger, sir? How's that? I just thought perhaps you might have... Wanted to be the first one on hand when the tigers crash through, that's all. You're being impertinent, Drindle. That's very unlike you, Drindle. Is it, sir? Same as you're lying. It was unlike you to lie to me. Yeah, I suppose it was. You know it was. Now, you're not going to tell me the latest notice on the bulletin board was also your invention, are you? I'm not going to tell you anything, Mr. Winthrop. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm sure you'll agree that it's not my place to tell you anything. I most certainly and emphatically do agree. I thought you would. Not that I'm certain that the three tigers will crash through the windows. No, I, I'm not certain at all. It's absurd on the face of it, isn't it? Most absurd. Three tigers. Well, now. Perfectly ridiculous. And one with a chicken in his mouth. Ha, <laughs> ha, It's laughable. <laughs> well, don't laugh. Because it just may happen, precisely as the notice predicts. We simply do not know. I promise not to laugh.
Nervous, Cudworth? A few flutters. It's the uncertainty, of course. I've been here since four o'clock. Can you imagine that? I had a hard time staying away myself. I had a few sharp words earlier with Rindle. Sorry to say. The old man's getting very independent, very opinionated. Where is he? He's usually around taking drink orders by now. He's standing over there by the main door looking very superior. Mm. We really have to retire that fellow, Cudworth. Uh, Winthrop! Cudworth, do you realize... Do you realize people are standing outside on the sidewalk? This isn't a club matter anymore. It's spread all over the city. Oh, I can't say I care for that. It looks like hundreds of people. I, I tried to get Ashley to be with us for the, for the great event, but he insists on his post by the window. Ashley by the window, old Drindle by the main door. Well, uh, we're well covered. We, we should be quiet. It, it, it's time. I don't think our conversation will either deter or encourage the tigers. Yes, but all the same. You, you... Quiet. Quiet. Did they... Is he... Don't... Don't look, Winthrop. Better not look. Is Brindle... Did the tigers get him? I don't know. Well, here's Ashley. Maybe he knows something. Ashley, what happened? Old Drindle's dead. Oh, no. How did it happen? Heart attack, apparently. Not the tigers. There isn't a scratch on him. They simply jumped over him, knocked down the big door, and disappeared. Old Drindle never believed in the tigers. Oh, is it conceivable he didn't see them? Oh, he saw them all right. Well, how can you be sure? Well, don't you remember, just before the tigers reached the door, he called for help. He... he saw them. He called for help. And he died. Of fright, do you think? Can you think of anything more frightening than the sight of something you never believed in? coming to get you? Let's uh, step in here for a few minutes, gentlemen. Uh, we won't be disturbing you, Katie, if we use part of the lounge, will we? What happened in here, Mr. Winthrop? Who upset all the furniture? Uh, uh, a little fracas, Katie, with uh, some unexpected visitors. Uh, let's set our drinks down here. Pull up chairs, everybody. There's a few that weren't overturned. Well, we'll have a new steward tomorrow. They're promoting someone from the dining room. You'll never hold a candle to Drindle, no matter who he is. Drindle was a good man. If you gentlemen are going to be using this room, I can clear out and come back later. Now, you go right ahead with your cleaning, Katie. If you don't mind sweeping around us. Oh, it's all right with me. <laughs> there, there, there. Certainly is a mess. Gentlemen... I asked you to meet with me here because I have a confession to make. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't tell you before, but... Well, I didn't. But now I must. After the incident of the White Goddess gentleman, Brindle told me that he himself had posted those notices on the bulletin board. Brindle? The one about the devil? And the White Goddess? That one too? I didn't believe him. After all, we saw the devil, most of us, and we all saw the white goddess. And to believe Drindle would be to admit that he had the power to summon them up. What, 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 what about the three tigers? One with a chicken in his mouth? We saw them too. And in all probability, so did Drindle. And the sight killed him. Is it possible that a man like Drindle had the power to invoke such things? Well, I must now concede that he did. There I must take issue with you, Winthrop. Drindle only put up the notices. The power lay within us. The membership. 
I, for one, claim no such power. You, for one, have no such power, Ashley. Nor have I. Nor has Winthrop or Higgins or any member of the club separately. Or consciously. But unconsciously and collectively, the power is ours. Together and without knowing it, we can do such astounding things. Together and without knowing it, we are constantly doing astounding things, are we not? And always have. Both for good and for evil. I call your attention to the biblical story of the Battle of Jericho. We all know that stone walls cannot be shattered by a band of men marching round them, a final blast of trumpets and a great shout. We know that. And yet it happened. The walls of Jericho fell. Uh, why did they? Consider the circumstances. The Israelites outside the fortress city the eagerness, the expectancy, and above all, the desire and the belief. Consider the steady tramp of marching feet. Consider the narrowed concentration of the marchers. No man divided in his mind, and no mind divided from the mind of any other man. Consider the psychic pressure created by such a congregation. A uh, mass hallucination? It was no hallucination that Jericho fell to Joshua. No. I should call it mass projection. And that's what happened here? To us? We. All of us. Acting in concert. Projected these apparitions by the sheer force of our unconscious minds. Then... We weren't wrong. We really saw them. The devil, the white goddess. The three tigers. One with a chicken in his mouth. We really saw them, even as the walls of Jericho really fell. I beg your pardon, sir. Uh, what is it, Katie? Oh, look what I swept up over by the main door, sir. If I'm not mistaken, they're chicken feathers. What's been going on here, sir? <laughs> And so ends our tale of magic. A magician performs his tricks. We are delighted and applaud because we cannot comprehend how he did them. But what if the magician himself cannot comprehend? I'll be back shortly. To know the truth, for the truth shall make you free. I believe that, but it's a long search and a weary one. And let's be glad that a lot of mystery remains, and there's a little magic here and there along the way. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Mary Jane Higby, Ian Martin, Ralph Bell, Guy Sorrell, and Sidney Walker. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Kidnappings of a publisher's daughter and a newspaper's editor have turned out to be poles apart politically, as well as at opposite ends of the country. I'm Steve Young, reporting on the CBS radio network. 
Finally, Thursday night, more than a day after Reg Murphy was kidnapped, the Atlanta Constitution received a tape made by him. How it got from Murphy's kidnappers to the paper still is not clear. He voiced their name, the American Revolutionary Armies, their ransom demand, $700,000, and their complaint. The news media is too leftist. The newspaper says it will pay the ransom. The ARA also is calling for the resignation of all federally elected officials, promising to, quote, return the American government to the American people. Murphy's release is not conditioned, though, upon those terms being met. About the only thing the right-wing ARA has in common with the left-wing Symbionese Liberation Army, which kidnapped Patricia Hearst, is that few, if any, non-members heard of either group before they made their moves. One excerpt from the Murphy Turpin uh, tape indicates timing of the kidnappings was to be coordinated, but nothing else. I have been asked to tell you that my abduction was planned at the same time that the uh, Symbionese Liberation Army uh, abducted Miss Hurst and that there were circumstances uh, which made it uh, uh, difficult to do that at that time. I think it's, I would just say, and it's fair that the two groups uh, don't uh, work in concert at all. Uh, they don't share, as I understand it, the same goals. Uh, and don't work in the same way. The voice of Reg Murphy kidnapped some 29 hours ago. The latest on the Hearst kidnapping in a minute. Sophia Loren. As beautiful as erotic dreams. Great cook, great crook. Cheat you at cards anytime. The writer, believe it or not, is the actor Richard Burton. His beautifully written tribute to Sophia, another leading lady in his life, appears exclusively in the current issue of Ladies Home Journal. Richard writes that Sophia is treated like a queen. She should be. She is one, observes Burton, who says Sophia tends to correct his spoken English and his acting. I always obey, writes Richard. She's always right. Sophia Loren by Richard Burton in the journal. Also in this issue, a preview of a startlingly candid new book about Joan, the tormented Kennedy. Martha Mitchell's life today with a first-time ever photo tour of her lonely New York dream house. Also in the journal... How much do Jackie's clothes really cost? Sylvia Porter's tax tips and Mia Farrow models Great Gatsby fashions. All in the new Ladies Home Journal, The Priceless Environment, on newsstands now. In San Francisco, food distribution to the poor is to begin in the morning at four pickup points. But the Symbionese Liberation Army, which kidnapped Randolph Hearst's daughter Patricia two and a half weeks ago, says the $2 million program agreed to by Hearst isn't enough. It wants four million more. There are mixed opinions as to the feasibility of meeting that six million dollar demand. The administrator of the Hearst plan said he's confident food donations will top the demand. But the purchasing agent says that as the result of the tight food market and transportation problems, he's scraping the bottom of the barrel just to get enough food for the initial two million dollar program. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has told Latin American foreign ministers meeting in Mexico City that top-level negotiations on a new Panama Canal Treaty will start in May in Washington. That, according to a U.S. official, who also said Kissinger has indicated Washington's willingness to work out interim offshore fishing rights with Latin American nations, which claim sovereignty to 200 miles. This country only claims and recognizes 12-mile rights. Pennsylvania service station owners are threatening to shut down at 6 p.m. Friday to protest the federal gasoline allocation plan. Federal Energy Chief William Simon met with seven governors in Washington Thursday. Later, one of the governors, Daniel Evans of Washington State, said Simon was considering whether to allow higher prices and preferential treatment for regular customers, a decision expected soon. Iran says it's ready to deposit $1 billion with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund to help poor nations hurt by rising oil prices. Iran would get commercial interest rates on the money, which would be used to make long-term low-interest loans. The Egyptian newspaper Al-Ahram says censorship on foreign newsmen has been lifted for all subjects except military stories. I'm Steve Young, CBS News.